Hello, everybody, and thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me here today. It's actually my first time at this conference, and I'm pretty excited uh, to see the lineup. Um, and I also want to give a shout out uh, to Diana for handling that like a pro and giving an awesome talk, and also to Carlos, because his whole, whole talk is effectively an introduction for mine, so he's making my job very easy. Um, so as mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the ICANN School of Medicine in New York. So New York is a city you might have heard of. Um, and <laughs> uh, it's, uh, here's the five boroughs of New York. Um, I moved back there from California, so I was in Carlos's uh, lab as a postdoc, and I moved back there from California about four years ago. I'm very fond of both places. <laughs> but in New York, we, uh, I'm at the School of Medicine at uh, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is actually the biggest healthcare system servicing uh, New Yorkers. Uh, it consists of a main hospital that's in the neighborhoods of the Upper East Side, ab abutting uh, East Harlem, if people know New York, and it has seven hospital campuses around mainly Manhattan, but also into Queens and Brooklyn, and literally hundreds of family practices and ambulatory care clinics, uh, and all feeding into a single data warehouse uh, and a single um, system, Epic, uh, uh, so that actually in uh, Mount Sinai healthcare system, we cover the lives of about four million New Yorkers, so that's one in every two New Yorkers. Um, we have a density of people coming in from nearby our main hospital campuses. So you see uh, people coming uh, in, in Richmond in, in neighborhoods um, in Central Harlem and Upper East Side and East Harlem. And actually, we have a hospital campus down near the Lower East Side as well. But really, we have patients coming in from all over the boroughs, either into clinics or making the trip in the subway uh, in, into Manhattan. Uh, Mount Sinai Healthcare System serves an extraordinarily diverse uh, set of patients. Here's a representation of types of diversity in Manhattan. Uh, this is taking a view of the US Census category. This is data from the US Census category from 2010. And if you just sort of divide up the neighborhoods in Manhattan based on proportion ancestry as reported in Census Bureau, uh, you get a picture like this. So you see lots of neighborhoods are predominantly African American or Hispanic Latino or Asian. And then we have lots of uh, neighborhoods that are rather mixed. So if you take that same data and you just put it into a pie chart, it looks like this, and this is the composite of, of racial and ethnic uh, demography in New York. Uh, about 33% uh, Caucasian or white, uh, about 26% African American or black, about 28% of people also report that they are Hispanic Latino, and then we have a sizable uh, Asian, East and South Asian population, and then quite a number of people, 4%, who report mixed ancestry or don't identify with any of these categories. Now, if you ask about the demography captured in the electronic health record in Mount Sinai, the picture looks very different. So remember, this is 4 million New Yorkers, so it should be fairly representative of the previous pie chart, but we see that it's, in fact, not. Uh, now, uh, the uh, self-reporting in the electronic record can happen many ways. It can happen when a patient self-reports themselves. It can happen when somebody signs in and checks a box on, box on a form. It can also happen when a physician or receptionist t checks that box for them. So we see that we actually do not a bad job of uh, identifying who is European ancestry versus who is African ancestry, uh, but an epically bad job of identifying people in the electronic health record who are Asian or Hispanic. Um, now, of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So US census categories uh, do a pretty good job of defining broad ethnic and racial groups, but really don't tell you a lot about the immense diversity of people and populations that inhabit New York City. This is a, a website you might be familiar with, uh, known as Humans of New York. I visit it every day when I'm procrastinating on my grant writing. And, and it contains stories and anecdotes from people who ha live in New York or have come to New York. Um, and you, it just gives you a picture of the extraordinary diversity. 
Uh, so at Mount Sinai, we have an institutional commitment to servicing uh, diverse populations. We have great schools in global health and, and population health sciences. And we also have invested in the last particularly uh, 10 years heavily in genomics research. As part of that, we have built a biobank. So we have the Mount Sinai, we call it the BioMe Biobank program. Uh, that solicits recruitment from our local populations. Uh, I won't tell you too much about it. It is IRB approval, approved. Uh, we're currently at about 33,000 uh, participants from the Matainai uh, healthcare system. It's an open-ended design. We take anybody who walks into the clinic. We recruit at a rate of about 500 new participants a month. Um, and when we... Uh, here we go. When uh, we recruit people to the biobank, we ask them an extensive questionnaire about themselves, about their family, about their health, about their environment, about their behaviors. Um, and we also ask very uh, detailed questions about their ancestry and their cultural identity and uh, how they self-report. So we ask questions that are very similar to kinds of questions you see in uh, the census data, where you can check one or more of multiple different uh, population group categories. But we also ask deeper questions about uh, where you were born, where your parents were born, where your grandparents were born. So if you take that data and you plot it up, you actually now start to get a much deeper and richer picture of diversity in New York City. Uh, so this is looking at, uh, at participants' self-reported country of birth, and the first thing to notice is 35% of participants were not born in mainland US. Um, now, uh, a lot of them were actually born in the Caribbean, and we have a, a large uh, Puerto Rican population in New York, so about 17% uh, uh, of individuals were born in Puerto Rico which of course is part of the US. Uh, but we also see a lot of uh, people coming from all over the world. Uh, so from Europe and South America and Asia. And if we go back even two generations, so where were your grandparents born? We see a much bigger swath of people were, were coming from all over the world. We see slightly different patterns. These actually interestingly line up with uh, world events at the time, if you kind of extrapolate back. Um, and interestingly, again, over 95% of our Hispanic Latino population had grandparents that were born outside the US. Now, uh, as a geneticist, you can take this data and you can look at the diversity, not just in how people self-report and, and where they or their family might have come from, but also in terms of genetic diversity. This is a tool we use in population genetics a lot. It's called a PCA plot, Principal Components Analysis. And here in colors, I've represented what we call reference panels, or Carlos uh, has spoken to you about, from different continents in the world. And then you plot the BioMe participants on this, and you see that there's a big decline of people coming from almost every corner of the world. Um, so the first thing I want to point out in this, at least from a genetics perspective, there's no such thing as discrete populations. As you can see, we have people represented on this plot who can really live in any corner of, the, of global genetic diversity as we're looking at it here. And this is a concept that I think is going to become increasingly important, particularly how today we use self-reported identity for clinical diagnostics and in some of the tests we run. And I'm not going to be able to talk about it today, but I just want to mention uh, uh, some work both from my lab and some great labs in UCSF, Noah Zaitlin and Esteban Burchard, who are really thinking about the role of genetic ancestry in some of these tests and starting to demonstrate that it, if you measure genetic ancestry, you can do a much better job, a much more precise job uh, for some of these diagnostic tests. But today I want to talk about another aspect of uh, communities and diaspora and what happens, which is a concept we call in genetics cryptic relatedness. You can think of it as distant cousins. Uh, because this is also something that I think is a, a possibly a little underappreciated, and it turns out to be very important in identifying communities that might share genetic risk for disease. Uh, so what do I mean? What I mean is that we probably all live in communities uh, where we might have some distant relatives, so fifth cousin, 10th cousin, 20th cousin, uh, that we are related to genealogically, but we probably are not aware. Uh, this happens also through processes of migration. 
And not all the time, but sometimes we may have some residual genetic uh, identity with those individuals. It can be a small chunk of your genome, but you might share it with an ancestor 20 generations ago. So this is uh, an, a concept that we've been working on in my lab. We call it, uh, the field calls it identity by descent. And you can measure it across a population. In other words, you can take every pair of individuals in population and ask, do they share any DNA identical by descent? And when you do, you can construct nice bird's eye view maps like this. And this looks like a, a graph network. And here, each dot is a person. And each line between the dots is, uh, indicates that they are sharing genetic material that is uh, inherited from a common ancestor quite far back in time. So when you look at this data, you can see kind of patterns that reflect the demography of these populations. So for example, uh, we see most sharing within Ashkenazi Jewish populations versus all the other populations. And we know Ashkenazi Jewish populations are a founder population due to cultural practices of endogamy and migration. Um, we also see sharing between European populations and Hispanic Latino populations representing the shared uh, history uh, of European settlers who came to the Americas. But we can also do uh, some fun exercises, not just to organize people into self-reported groups or uh, how we think usually about populations, but rather to allow the sharing within groups of people to tell us about uh, communities. So I want to point out that this is work from a very talented grad uh, student in my lab, Gillian Belbin. Uh, I'm not going to have too much time to tell you exactly how we do it, but uh, without saying too much, you can already see that there is patterns of communities in this plot. Uh, for example, this green circle here, this green group are actually Ashkenazi Jews, so 75% of people who self-report they're Jewish are in this plot, actually 100% who genetically we know are Jewish are in this, this group. And in all in all, we have about 10 different communities. We, have, we can link back to the EHR, and we can actually link these people back to the neighborhoods in which they live to reassure ourselves that we are defining groups that make sense. Uh, so for example, the Puerto Rican cluster, those who were born in Puerto Rico tend to live in, in South Bronx and, and East Harlem. Those who report that they're Hispanic Latino, so we don't know that they're Puerto Rican, uh, but are belonging to that cluster, also live in those same neighborhoods. And we can go through this exercise of many neighborhoods. So for example, uh, the Dominican cluster contains people who live in Washington Heights, otherwise known as Little Dominican, Dominico. Okay, so uh, very, very quickly, I'm just going to point out why this might be important. So we noticed in our early work looking at these communities uh, that we found a genetic signature underlying very short stature. Uh, so if you have two copies of this gene, then you're about seven to 10 inches shorter than, than average. So for women, about four foot two, for men, about four foot 10. Uh, we did a lot of work to figure out what the underlying causal variant is. Uh, I'm gonna skip through the biology, but just get to the punchline, which is it is a known Mendelian disorder gene. Um, and if you go to some of the clinical databases, you'll see that it's actually there. And described in the literature in a couple of uh, places, including things like short stature, mainly in children, and also some uh, sort of uh, skeletal disorders. So this was very interesting because once we discovered it was a collagen gene, we had gone back to the electronic health re record and we looked at the progress notes for these patients and we were starting to pull out very similar things that looked very syndromic. So for example, hip dysplasia, uh, cervical cord compression, and so what we were finding in the health record was really matching what had been found in the medical genetics literature. Now, the other thing uh, that we've learned is since the, the recessive state causes this Mendelian disorder, uh, what, were, what was happening with the carriers? We knew this variant was actually damaging this gene. This is preliminary data, but it looks like uh, when we look across the entire electronic health record, if you are a carrier for this variant, we see some evidence that you may in fact have a subclinical phenotype for spinal degradation. So some of the ICD-9 codes that are very specific to that are popping up as highly, highly enriched. 
the surprise in all of this really uh, was not just sort of a rediscovery of a known genetic syndrome in a particular population, but that the genetic syndrome is actually rather common, so one in 2,000 affected rate. So for a Mendelian disorder, that's actually quite high. Uh, and about a 5% carrier rate, so if we're right about this subclinical phenotype, then that's an a, a avenue for research uh, for, uh, for surveillance for spine degradation. Okay, so I'm going to finish up. I'm a little over time, I apologize. Uh, so I think overall, uh, some of the lessons that, that Carlos mentioned, some of the lessons about embracing diversity uh, are not just imperative and important because of ethical reasons, because of, of scientific reasons, and I've just showed you how you can really leverage this to make novel discoveries, but also because um, we are serving these populations, and if we really want to get past a, an average population, one-size-fits-all uh, standard of care for, for, for patients, we need to actually understand diversity and, and risk factors, not just genetic, others as well, that are impacting each population. Thank you. <laughs>